We want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer. This is the Situation Room special report, North Korean crisis. Happening now, North Korea may, repeat, may, may be ready to launch. Uh, the U.S. is tracking missile movements that could push the region closer to war. He's armed and dangerous. We're taking a closer look at what may be driving Kim Jong-un to make brazen threats and defy the world. And dialing it down, the Obama administration addressed its concerns that its response uh, to this crisis has only made matters worse. It's one of the world's uh, most dangerous regimes uh, right now, and now uh, North Korea says it is on the brink of war. U.S. officials fear it may be planning a missile launch soon. The threats have been uh, amping up every single day from a nation under the thumb of a young and unpredictable leader. Kim Jong-un is armed with a huge military, powerful conventional weapons, and a nuclear program. This hour, our correspondents are taking an in-depth look at the threat to the United States and the world and President Obama's response. And Christiana Amanpour and Fareed Zakaria, they are here. They'll give us a global view of this crisis unfolding right now. But let's begin with our Pentagon correspondent, Bar Barbara Starr, who's watching all of this unfold. It's pretty tense. What's the latest, Barbara? Well, Wolf, as you know, the talk has been hot rhetoric for days now. And now new information about a possible missile test by North Korea that poses a new threat. It's one of the most alarming signals yet that Kim Jong-un is exercising his military might. CNN has learned that classified U.S. imagery and communications intercepts confirm North Korea has moved up to two mobile missiles, launchers and fuel tanks to its east coast. The concern? Kim Jong-un is planning to test missiles that could threaten the region with little warning. The reaction time is much less when you have mobile launchers. The missile, called the Musadon, has a 2,500-mile range. It could someday hit targets as far away as Guam and even Alaska's west coast. The problem right now? The test could send a missile over Japan. U.S. warships armed with their own missiles would have to quickly react if it looks like Japanese territory is threatened. If the missile is mobile, we've got to either be following it constantly or be lucky enough to surveil all the area where it could be. U.S. intelligence satellites are scouring North Korea's coastline for signs of a launch, especially here at Tonghe. There may also be a hidden launch pad somewhere, U.S. officials say. The ultimate concern is that North Korea has progressed in trying to put a nuclear warhead on top of these mobile missiles. It already has enough material for up to half a dozen nuclear bombs. But some experts warn the U.S. shouldn't get overexcited about Kim's threats of war. He and his advisors must know that they will not, this extortion will not work any longer. They, they're not going to be exacting any concessions from the United States or anyone else. Now, still, the U.S. and the Allies hope that Pyongyang will issue one of these standard notices to commercial aviation and shipping before it launches a missile towards Japan, warning everyone to stay out of the launch or the impact area. Looking for that notice, that's going to be the first sign that a launch may be imminent. Wolf? Let's hope that doesn't happen. All right, Barbara, thanks very much. Let's get the administration's react in our, uh, reaction. Our White House correspondent, Brianna Keeler, is working this part of the story. What are they saying over at the White House? How worried are they, Brianna? Well, if White House officials are downplaying that there's any new real level of concern here, that they are significantly more concerned at this moment. They say North Korea has been on the radar for a while, particularly since December with that ballistic uh, missile test that was successful. But I'll tell you, the discussions here on North Korea are very much in overdrive. One senior administration official telling me that top officials from the State Department, the Defense Department, intelligence officials have been meeting uh, for uh, really much more frequently here in the last week and a half in the Situation Room. So North Korea really becoming the most pressing foreign policy issue at this moment for the administration, Wolf. 
Uh, Brianna, stand by. Uh, you can certainly bet Pentagon officials are gaming out North Korea's next moves right now. We're doing the same thing in our virtual studio. CNN's Tom Foreman is there along with CNN military analyst, the retired U.S. Army General James Spider Marks. Walk us through this, Tom. Sure. Well, all eyes right now are, of course, on that east coast of North Korea. Why, General, would they do this missile placement there? Two possible missiles along that coast. Why? Tom, the East Coast is closer to the United States' presence in the region and its allies, Japan, South Korea, certainly. They didn't put it on the West Coast because they're not trying to threaten China. That's simple enough right there. Let's bring in what we're talking about here. We'll get rid of this and bring in a model of the type of uh, missile we're talking about, the Musadon that Barbara mentioned a minute ago. This was originally designed to be used by Soviet submarines. The Iranians have a version of this called the Shahab. It doesn't look like much of a missile. There are no fins on it. But let's talk a little bit more about it because one of the real keys here is the mobility, right? We always see Absolutely. it in parades like this. Why does that matter so very much? This is a mobile missile system. It can go anywhere and can launch from any location. All it needs is a piece of level terrain, and within minutes, Tom, this thing can launch. And let's talk about the capabilities of this as well. We're going to bring in some of the stats on this. Fairly big and a lot of different ways in which it can be presented, yes? Tom, this is about 40 to 60 feet in length. It's got a payload of about two and a half tons, but what's important is the warhead. We do not anticipate that it has a nuclear warhead at all. We think it's high explosive. So HE, high explosive, that's the concern right Correct. there. And yet when you talk about a high explosive uh, weapon like this, the question does become range, what it can hit. Let's bring in the map and talk about that a little bit because uh, as Barbara pointed out, you're talking about maybe 2,500 miles, possibly a one or two stage missile. If it's two stages, it might be able to get that far, not so much at one stage, and it becomes somewhat less reliable. But even best case scenario, Tom. they launch this, California has nothing to worry Tom, about. Tom, the mainland United States is not at risk at all. Hawaii is not at risk. Possibly the west coast of Alaska. But what is at risk is Korea, Japan, and certainly down in Guam, very much so underneath that umbrella. And Guam really matters. Very important. That's where the United States Air Force has a very large B-52 bomber presence. And those bombers are used in the defense of the peninsula. So it's critical that they stay protected. And of course, tens of thousands of troops in other areas here. One last question about all of this. If in fact this launches, one of these missiles, two of these missiles launch there, right. whether or not North Korea says it's the test, what happens immediately with all of our forces in the Tom, area? when that missile launches, it sets off an IR, an infrared signature, which is picked up from our satellites in space. It's then tracked by sea, land, and air-based radar. And it will determine, that totally automated system will determine the attitude, the azimuth, and the location of where that missile is headed. So computers are tracking it. This is, by the way, a, a, an inertial guided missile. Once it's launched, there's no guidance on it. So they will know pretty much where it's going. And if it's headed toward any U.S. or allied target, a ship, land, anything, what That happens? missile will be taken out by a high altitude anti-ballistic missile system. It will be gone. So there are many, many steps, as you can see, Wolf, in the analysis of where these missiles may be and what North Korea's intentions may be. But the response, no matter what they say, would largely be the same. Wolf? Would be intense indeed. Uh, guys, thanks very much. Let's bring in our uh, chief international correspondent, Christiane Amanpour. She's also the global affairs anchor for ABC News. Also joining us, CNN's Fareed Zakaria, the anchor of Fareed Zakaria GPS. Uh, Christiane, what's motivating all this tough talk from Kim Jong-un and his generals in North Korea? I think it's anybody's guess, and people have tried to psychoanalyze Kim Jong-un ever since he came in, and particularly in these last couple of weeks. Obviously, some people say he's trying to prove himself to his own people, prove himself to his own hardliners, perhaps even prove himself to those who may be pulling the puppet strings. Who knows? What we know is what's being said and what the reaction is. What we also know, and I spoke to uh, Professor Siegfried Hecker, who's the last American to have gone into Yongbyon, the nuclear plant that they have, he says, and he's very confident, that they do not have the nuclear capability, as the general said, to threaten either South Korea or the United States. They could perhaps deliver some kind of warhead to South Korea, but not on a missile, maybe by plane, maybe by a uh, ship or truck, but they don't have that 
ballistic delivery capability. They also, if they restart Yongbyon, which they've said that they would, that's their plutonium reprocessing plant, it could take six months to a year. Remember, we went in there, I went in there in 2008. I watched them disable it. That was sort of a honeymoon period between North Korea and, and the West as they disabled it. And then it sort of came, comes to where it is right now. They said it could restart within six months yeah, to a year. Those were the good old days. Uh, not so good these days right now. Uh, Fareed, uh, the, the, fear, the fear is, though, that there could be a miscalculation, even though no one thinks North Korea is suicidal because they know they would be destroyed if they were to do something drastic. If there were the incident and the new government in South Korea responded, who knows what would happen? That's exactly right, Wolf. The, the, the problem is imagine that one of these missiles is launched, uh, their, their K-8 missile, the KM-8 missiles. They, they, they don't have uh, nuclear warheads small enough to put on them, so they would be high explosive, but they launch it in the sky. We have destroyers that have phased array Aegis uh, uh, radars, track them, we fire our own missile, the SM-3, to, to, to uh, intercept and destroy it. Then the North Koreans feel they've lost face. They have to do something. They start attacking South Korean patrol boats. You see, that's, th that's the danger. Nobody wants this to happen. I think the Obama administration is playing this just right, which is, this is at some level bluster. Uh, what you don't want to do is to overreact to it, which then forces them to show that they're actually serious, and then you go down a kind of tit-for-tat game. So you've got to provide assurance and deterrence, assurance to the Japanese and the South Koreans, who are the most concerned. You have to deter the North, uh, the North Koreans, but you can't play into this game because they are both somewhat irrational, they don't have very good command and control, one has to assume, and there could be some kind of miscalculation. Does he really think he can get concessions, Kim Jong-un, money from China, from the South Korea, from the United States, by this tough talk? Well, Wolf, it's a pattern that has happened over the last decades with this regime. They do believe that they can, and they have been able to do this, this sort of extortion policy, if you like, in this regard. Obviously, nobody wants to let that happen right now. The United States is now saying, and you've heard Barbara Starr said at the, at the State Department, they said it today, they want to dial back. They want to perhaps give some kind of diplomacy an outlet. What they probably will not be doing over the next several weeks as these joint military games continue between the South Koreans and the U.S., they probably won't be showing some of the more uh, demonstrable shows of force, like, I don't know, a marine amphibious landing on the coast and this and that. They probably won't be showing that. And if they do, that also could be uh, an issue. But I think that diplomacy is the problem and they haven't had real diplomacy between either the Obama administration or the Bush administration, and this is what's having uh, a, a major problem. Is it time to send some sort of diplomatic envoy to Pyongyang on behalf of the President of the United States? Well, the Bush administration actually did try diplomacy. They signed two agreements with the, with the North Koreans. The Clinton people did. The problem is, as Christian pointed out, they cheat on them. They've cheated on every one of these. There is only one country wh with whom diplomacy would work with North Korea, and that's China. The Chinese provide 50% of North Korea's food, 80% of its fuel. There are, there are people in China who literally open the taps and allow North Korea to survive. The problem is the Chinese have never thought that they could put the real pressure on the North Koreans without danger of the regime collapsing. So it's for the Chinese, they, they worry about all this stuff. They don't like this, you know, the unpredictability of this regime. But they don't want to see a North Korean collapse. What does that mean? It means millions of refugees into China. More importantly, it means almost inevitably the unification of the Koreas, North and South, in the kind of East German, West German style, on South Korean terms. So here's what you'd have on China's border. A very large Korea with Seoul as its capital, with 40,000 American troops, a treaty alliance with the United States, and nuclear weapons. Guys, it's a complex, complex situation, but it's perilous right now. We're going to continue this conversation also. A broader look at North Korea's military and massive firepower. The danger goes much deeper than simply one missile test. And later, from the NBA to North Korea, did Dennis Rodman's recent visit have any influence at all on Kim Jong-un? The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, he is certainly a huge reason why this crisis right now is so uncertain and so very dangerous. He's young, virtually unknown, and this is his first 
major test in the global arena. CNN's Kyung Law has put together uh, what we know about him. She's joining us now from Seoul, South Korea. He's critical in all of this. Kyung, tell us what we know. Well, to the outside world, he is simply the odd offspring of a tyrant, more image than man, an image developed by North Korea's twisted propaganda machine. He is the third of the Kim dynasty, a man not yet 30, in command of a nuclear arsenal, ballistic missiles, and the world's fourth largest army. But Kim Jong-un is in many ways an enigma and a dangerous one at that. The youngest son of Kim Jong-il, he had a privileged upbringing while millions of North Koreans starved, attending an elite boarding school in Switzerland under a false name. A Brazilian classmate remembers him as a shy teenager. He was very quiet. He didn't speak with a anyone. He was uh, competitive uh, at the sports. It's, uh, for him, uh, he, he didn't like to lose. He liked basketball and football and video games. His father had served a long apprenticeship before taking over the hermit kingdom. But Kim Jong-un was catapulted into the leadership, suddenly becoming a general in his mid-20s without serving a day in the military. When his father died in December of 2011, Kim Jong-un became supreme leader and the state propaganda machine went into overdrive. They've been trying to establish this uh, myth regarding his expertise. He speaks eight languages. He's a military genius and, and uh, technical genius. And a leader with the complete backing of the military. In his first public remarks as leader, he spoke of the heartbreak of a divided Korea. But there was also a warning. Our military has become a powerful military, able to handle any kind of modern warfare with complete uh, offensive and defensive capabilities. The foreign powers are not the only ones with monopoly on military supremacy. But he also promised no more famine. It is our party's firmest resolve not to let our citizens go hungry again. As he has consolidated his rule, Kim has tried to promote his youthful side, attending a concert with Disney characters and a youth festival, watching basketball with Dennis Rodman. Kim Jong-un has also married. His young, attractive wife was announced by state media as comrade Ri sol Ju. But he has also reinforced North Korea's military first policy. <laughs> With the successful launch of a ballistic missile in December and another underground nuclear test in February. And the biggest and most dangerous gap is that we simply do not know, Wolf, what is happening inside this young man's mind. Wolf? A lot of technical information we, uh, the world knows about North Korea, but inside stuff, uh, obviously, that is a key, key problem. Kyung, we're going to get back to you. Kyung lies in Seoul, South Korea. It's only about 30 miles or so from the demilitarized zone with North Korea. North Korea's nuclear capabilities are an open question. Their conventional military is heavily equipped, capable of inflicting immense casualties and damage on the millions and millions of people just below the demilitarized zone. Let's go back to CNN's Tom Foreman and retired U.S. Army General Spider Marks for more on this. Tom. Yeah, Wolf, there's a tremendous amount of power in the hands of this young man. Let's go through it a little bit if we can. Spider, let's talk about this nuclear capability first. What do we really think they have right now? Tom, we think they have eight bombs. They probably have the material for 12, but we don't think these are weaponized. They haven't been married up with a missile capability to launch it someplace else. So, so they, they are weapons, but as long as they're not able to be delivered well, they're not weaponized. That's, that's not what we're worried correct. about there. Correct. Well, what about the other hardware they have? They have a tremendous amount of artillery and rockets, missiles, things like this. Talk about that some. The North Korean military, the Korean People Army, was trained by the Soviets and trained by the Chinese Communists. So they rely on volumes and volumes of artillery fire. So they have a massive amount of artillery and surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And we would see those at the start of a conflict. And a lot of this artillery has been dug in ever since the end of the Korean conflict. Absolutely so they've has. been preparing for 50 years for the next one. They sure have. They yeah. sure have. Completely where the, where the armistice was signed, when the ceasefire was signed back in 53, 1953, is where a lot of those units remain today. Okay. And beyond that, there is this question of the sheer number of people that they have for a really quite small country, massive army. They have the fifth largest military in the world, over a million men under arms. That's on the active component. The reserve component has got about eight million folks. And that's about the largest 
reserve component military in the world, and they can be mo mobilized at a moment's notice. Are they generally considered to be well trained? They are the active component, very well trained. We're, and in fact, when you compare the military to the population, the military has a much higher level of nutrition, training, so they are prepared. Uh, a couple of other things to talk about here. They have a Navy, so to speak. They have an Air Force. Uh, they have submarines. But we don't think of those in the traditional way we do other uh, forces like that. Tom, let me talk about the Air Force for a second. Our primary concern about their Air Force is for the insertion of their very large, over 100,000 special operations forces. Now, the Navy can also insert special operations forces through midget submarines and other type of watercraft that they have. Then they would also activate sleeper agents that are in the south, and they would go after targets to disrupt the decision-making capability of the United Nations Command. So the simple truth is, Wolf, uh, even if you get past the nuclear question here, there is a formidable military force in North Korea right now. Wolf? It's huge indeed. Could cause enormous, enormous destruction and disaster. Guys, thanks uh, for that report. Still ahead, an administration insider on President Obama's North Korea playbook and what's worrying him most right now. And life in North Korea as I saw it when I was there during another time of crisis in the region. I'm Wolf Blitzer and this is the Situation Room special report, the North Korean crisis. The Obama administration is struggling right now to calm an explosive situation in North Korea. As we reported, Kim Jong-un may be gearing up for a new missile launch soon after weeks of warmongering. Take a look at how he's been ramping up tensions in the region. Tensions began to skyrocket in mid-February when North Korea went ahead with its third nuclear test. A furious U.N. Security Council hit back a few weeks later, imposing punishing new sanctions. The U.S. began planned war games with South Korea, and the North said it was pulling out of the agreement that ended the Korean War. Direct threats against America intensified. North Korean TV aired a video simulating an attack on the White House and the Capitol building. In a show of force, the U.S. added nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers to its military drills with South Korea. Then... Kim Jong-un put his forces on standby to strike the U.S. mainland, Guam, and Hawaii, and he declared a state of war with the South. U.S. stealth fighter jets joined those war games in the region, and the threats went nuclear. North Korea said it would restart a closed plutonium reactor, and the regime claimed its plans for a nuclear attack on the U.S. were ready to go. The U.S. has ordered missile defenses to nearby Guam as fears grow that North Korea may be planning a launch soon. We've assembled our own uh, security council here in the Situation Room, uh, including some of the more knowledgeable folks about North Korea to try to break all of this down for you. Joining us now is Tommy Vitor. Uh, he served in the Obama White House. He's a former spokesman for the National Security Council. Also joining us, Christopher Hill. He's the former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea. He's now Dean of the School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And retired U.S. Navy Admiral William Fallon. He served as the head of the U.S. Pacific Command and the U.S. Uh, Central Command. Uh, Admiral Fallon, uh, what worries me the most is a miscalculation that could trigger all-out war. Am I overly concerned, or are you concerned about that as well? Wolf, I think it's, uh, it's prudent to, uh, to be concerned and to certainly pay close attention to this, but I believe there's a, this thing may be a little bit overhyped right now. Some Tell us why. I Tell us why. Well, the first thing is uh, his ability to strike the U.S. I think is, uh, is mostly talk. Uh, there's a possibility that some of his missiles might be able to range Alaska or, or possibly U.S. territory or bases closer in, but unlikely uh, they've never demonstrated an ability to get anything uh, to fly as far as the U.S. It took them uh, many years to try to get that one missile that we call the Taepodong 2 to fly. So I think... Uh, there's an awful lot of rhetoric. It's not helpful, of course, but this is, uh, this is a lot of uh, the same old stuff out of the, uh, the playbook that his father and, and grandfather used, and it's unfortunate. Uh, you got to wonder uh, what he's up to and, uh, and what the real motivation is, whether he's just trying to act strong in front of his, his military people uh, or, uh, again, what's worked in the past uh, in some instances is to act outrageously and then uh, demand some kind of concession and... Uh, 
and move on. But it is a time to be uh, very attentive. I think we've made, the U.S. has made some very prudent moves. We have a significant missile defense capability. I think uh, we're, our people are certainly up to the task. And uh, from what I can see, I don't get any daily intel reports anymore, but I, it looks to me like we've, we've taken the appropriate precautions. Where does diplomacy, Ambassador Hill, fit into this? Uh, they're, they're, the U.S. does have indirect contacts with North Korea. The South Koreans do. Japan uh, China, but where, where, would, where should the U.S. be engaged right now in trying to ease this crisis? Well, I think there are basically two tracks. One is with our allies, South Korea and Japan. I think it's been very important uh, that we reassure them and that we not hold back on these annual exercises. So if there's an air component to these exercises, we need to go through with that because we need to really assure our allies. So that's one track. The second track is, of course, with China. China, they may deny that they have a lot of uh, uh, leverage with the North Koreans, but uh, they do, and there's a lot more they can do. A third possible track might be with the North Koreans, but you know, they kind of started this dance and I'm not sure it would be in our interest to be kind of approaching them. I think you would uh, leave in their mind that we're somehow worried or afraid or somehow uh, blinking. So I think we need to be very careful in how we would deal directly with the North Koreans. I'd rather see a much more of, a, of an effort with China. Tommy uh, Vittori, uh, you, you know that back when he was a candidate in 2007, 2008, uh, President Obama at that point made it clear he's willing to talk to these kinds of despots, if you will, without preconditions. Uh, Dennis Rodman came back from uh, North Korea saying, call, call him, Kim, Kim Jong-un. You think that's something the president would even consider? Uh, huge thank you to Dennis Rodman for, uh, for delivering that message. Uh, I think the president has expressed a willingness to, to have direct negotiations or conversations with North Koreans, but you know, those need to be constructive and they can't be in the context of these absurd threats and this propaganda uh, and continued nuclear development, uh, continued tests of intercontinental ballistic missile technology. And so, you know, I, I agree with what the Admiral said. I think that anytime you combine long-range missile technology, efforts to develop a nuclear program, that's something you have to take very seriously. But the bottom line is the United States has been working on missile defense technology for years. The administration had recently announced that they'll put 14 more ground-based interceptors on the West Coast. They're putting additional radar capability in the region. Um, there are additional military ships in the region as part of regularly scheduled uh, military exercises. So some, this is something we're well prepared for. And I don't think your viewers should worry that there's an immediate homeland threat because the North Koreans simply haven't uh, indicated or uh, tested some of the weapons that would give them that capability. Everybody stand by for a moment. I want to go to the White House right now. Our correspondent Brianna Keeler once again is standing by. Uh, so are they worried at the White House, Brianna, uh, about this escalation uh, that's been going on now for the past few weeks and whether it has gone too far? Well, certainly, Wolf, there's a lot of talk among White House officials that they want to see things de-escalate, and you're seeing that in some of their changing rhetoric today. They also insist, though, that this sort of show of force has been a necessary deterrent to show Kim Jong-un that if he's going to make good on his threats, there will be consequences. I will tell you, Pentagon officials have been a little more candid with CNN. They say that after accusing North Korea of amping up its rhetoric, they're afraid they may have done the same thing. Worried that muscular displays of U.S. military might may have pushed North Korea too far, the Obama administration is changing its tone and says North Korea should too. We have also been saying all the way through that this does not need to get hotter, that it can, we can change course here if the DPRK will begin to come back into compliance with its international obligations We'll begin to um, uh, cool things down. Secretary of State John Kerry is leading the effort to dial back the discord, sources tell CNN, while behind the scenes at the White House, attention to an increasingly threatening North Korea is in overdrive. A senior administration source says top officials have been meeting more frequently in the Situation Room for the last week and a half. Deputies from the President's National Security Council, the Defense and State Departments, the CIA, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, among others, are at the table. Victor Shaw was a top advisor on North Korea to President George W. Bush. See, I think they're watching very carefully the situation. I think they're watching to see if there are military maneuvers or a higher level of military alert 
on the ground in North Korea that is accompanying all of this rhetoric. Now, don't expect North Korea to be leaving the headlines anytime soon, though, Wolf. The new president, Park, will be here next month visiting with President Obama, their first visit. And uh, it's certainly expected, I would say, that North Korea, as it does at times, may act up and try to steal some of the attention during that time as well. Brianna, thanks very much. Let's go back to our guests for some further analysis right now. There is a new government, Ambassador Hill, uh, in South Korea, and President Park, she's tough. Uh, if there is some sort of provo uh, provocation, I suspect, unlike her predecessor, she might respond right away, and that could escalate a dangerous situation. Well, she's tough, but I think the times have changed somewhat, and uh, uh, this North Korean uh, bluster is pretty serious. So I think the problem is the North Koreans might feel they can get away with some incident, whereas, as you suggest, I think the South Koreans would hit them back pretty hard. And there does appear to be some shift in their rules of engagement that as local commanders seem to be empowered to move right back at them rather than phone home to uh, Seoul. So I think it is kind of a dangerous situation. And as we look at the various paths of this, uh, of this crisis, I think uh, this kind of inadvertent uh, conflict could be the most serious. As you know, Admiral Fallon, two years or so ago, when I was in North Korea, the North Koreans did bomb an island. They killed a whole bunch of South Koreans. They attacked a, a South Korean warship and killed a lot of sailors. The South Koreans at that point did not retaliate. But I suspect if they did th those kinds of things again, the situation could explode. Uh, Wolf, I think it's uh, noteworthy that uh, within the last week or 10 days, there was a, an agreement reached between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. I don't know the details of it, but it sounds to me like it was uh, a, a heightened uh, effort to consult very closely in the event of some untoward incident or unpredictable uh, activity on the part of the DPRK. Uh, you know, we work very, very closely, have for many years uh, with our South Korean allies, there's a well-integrated uh, plan, uh, lots of discussion and, and exercises for many years. We work very well together. There's high level of confidence between the two militaries. And I think, again, it's, uh, this is a time to uh, certainly be very attentive, uh, to take uh, prudent precautions, which I believe we're doing, and to uh, consult very closely uh, with our allies in the region because this is fundamentally a regional issue. Tommy, uh, you worked uh, with the president for a long time when you were at the National Security Council. Uh, give us a little flavor how he deals with an emerging crisis like this. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say, Wolf, is that, you know, the, these problems with North Korea didn't emerge just recently, and this is something he's been working on for a long time. So his efforts to bolster our missile defense system is going to be critical. Um, but you're right that when there is an incident like this or a series of incidents, you know, the tempo picks up, the deputies committee uh, will meet more regularly, and the president will receive regular briefings uh, about the issue in his PDB and in other, other venues. But I mean, I, I don't think that the White House is on high alert right now uh, as a result of these actions. It's something that they've been aware of and working on for a long time. And the long game here, I think, is going to be uh, you know, conversations with the Chinese, because the United States can you know, work to get more sanctions on North Korea. Uh, and do a variety of other efforts to increase diplomatic pressure. But if the Chinese would just turn the screws a little more, uh, they could have a real impact with North Korea, and they need to stop letting them get away with these, these temper tantrums. Tommy Vitor, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Admiral Fallon and Christopher Hill, uh, guys, will continue this conversation. If cooler heads can't prevail and shooting actually begins, many uh, important U.S. targets could be within range of North Korea's guns and thousands, tens of thousands of U.S. troops also coming up this hour. Pictures from my own rare visit to North Korea. North Korea isn't the only country doing some serious uh, military muscle flexing right now. A pair of U.S. stealth bombers has made the round trip from their base in Missouri to South Korea and back. Plenty of other U.S. firepower is deployed much closer to North Korea and could become targets. CNN's Pentagon correspondent Chris Lawrence is joining us with more on what's going on. Uh, what are you seeing? What are you learning, Chris? Well, Wolf, you've got thousands of American troops stationed just about 15 miles south of the DMZ, and you've got all of North Korea's heavy armor and artillery aimed right at them. 
25 miles. It's the magic number as far as American troops are concerned. Some of North Korea's massive artillery can fire up to four mortar rounds a minute, 25 miles away. U.S. forces that are near the front are probably going to be within range of the artillery. About 10,000 American troops are deployed to bases around Camp Casey, just 15 miles from the DMZ. Others are concentrated at Osan Air Base. The U.S. recently put radar-evading Raptors on display there and flew long-range bombers like the B-2. But the risk to troops deploy closest to the DMZ will change. Over the next few years, the U.S. will move them to another base south of Seoul. That means that uh, the bulk of U.S. Uh, military forces in Korea are not going to necessarily be within range of the artillery strikes at the beginning. Farther out in the Western Pacific, the Navy deployed the USS Decatur and USS McCain, armed with a sophisticated radar system to detect North Korean missiles and then launch rockets to intercept and destroy them. The first reinforcements could come from one of the many American bases in Japan, home to the Navy's 7th Fleet and more than 100 aircraft. And some 2,000 miles away, North Korea threatened a nuclear strike on Guam. Now the U.S. is deploying a land-based missile defense system, somewhat easing fears of an attack on the U.S. territory. Though I am heartened to see these, these improvements in, in, in the defense posture, uh, I am concerned, as a, not only as a governor, but as a... As a, as a man who has a wife and children and grandchildren here. And, you know, those are the, some of the same concerns that, that husbands, wives, and children here in the U.S. have for their service members who are stationed over there in South Korea. One of the big advantages that the U.S. has is how quickly they can reinforce troops. Within two weeks, Wolf, they could double the size of their combat aircraft and triple the size of U.S. ground troops in the area. Yeah, in Guam, there's almost 6,000 U.S. troops who are based there at any one time, uh, not very far away indeed. Chris, thanks very much. North well. Korea only has two direct neighbors uh, right now, South Korea and China. The saber-rattling has nerves on edge in both countries. Let's get uh, the latest from our correspondents in the two capitals, starting with CNN's Jim Clancy in Seoul. The South Korean capital could become ground zero if there were to be a conflict here on the Korean peninsula. And the people who live here know that it's not the nuclear arms, it is the conventional weapons that are possessed by the North that could reduce this city, or parts of it at least, to ashes in a short period of time. Older people tell me that this is the most tense time they can remember since the end of the Korean War some 60 years ago. Younger people say, we can't relate to it. We are post-war. They do not believe that Kim Jong-un is going to attack the South. They believe instead that what he wants to do is to blackmail South Korea, to get the money, to get the food aid, in order to keep his dictatorship afloat. Jim Clancy, CNN Seoul. Let's go to David McKenzie right now in Beijing. Uh, what's going on over there? Uh, because. Everyone seems to think China could play a critically important role if the government in Beijing decided to. Well, Wolf, it's a smoggy day here in Beijing, and the mood is certainly darkening here in China with its close neighbor, longtime ally North Korea, ratcheting up that rhetoric and even making moves potentially for a missile strike. The key may be China, Wolf, with uh, China having a lot of influence over Pyongyang. Uh, they could literally close the taps, the fuel taps, the food taps, and even those conventional military ties between the two countries. A lot of frustration here in Beijing with North Korea, though, in recent months, particularly with that missile strike, uh, that missile test and nuclear test. Uh, their frustrations might be boiling over, and they could be pushing uh, for North Korea uh, to get to, to the negotiating table. Well, David McKenzie in Beijing for us. They're watching it very closely. Thank you. Uh, I was in North Korea just two uh, years ago. Uh, stand by for a rare look. Plus, we're going to assess the impact of Dennis Rodman's improbable visit with the North Korean leader. For all of North Korea's threats and its military power, its people don't have much. They live under very difficult conditions. I got a rare look inside the secretive nation when I traveled there at the end of 2010. 
Well, thank you so much. During my six days in North Korea, I didn't see a whole lot of color, unless you count the propaganda posters. We visited in the winter, when buildings often go unheated. In this school, it's so cold in the classroom, you could see their breath. Even today, top leaders like Kim Jong-un and his generals often wear overcoats indoors. Why the hardships? Because so much of their limited money goes to the military. According to the CIA, North Korea industry is crippled and there are chronic food shortages. Basically, it's like a starving country. It's overall always there looking for where are better food, where are something to eat to fill my stomach. Starvation reportedly killed up to 2 million people in the 1990s. This 24-year-old defected from North Korea six years ago. You can see dead people everywhere on the street. In this satellite photo, South Korea is blazing with lights at night. But North Korea is pitch black except for the capital. That capital, Pyongyang, is the home of top government officials with good salaries and impressive offices. We're on top of the world's tallest stone tower here overlooking Pyongyang. It really is majestic to see what's going on. You see the river, you see the uh, bitter cold, f freezing snow. The, uh, the buildings uh, are really impressive to see what's going on here in the North Korean capital. But one thing we noticed, not a lot of people with cars. There's not a whole lot of traffic here. Uh, it's icy. The streets are icy. It's snowy. You see a lot of people shoveling. Uh, and there you see the hammer and sickle uh, of this uh, communist government uh, manifestations of uh, the communist philosophy. The subway is clean and orderly, although the lights don't always stay on. It's very deep underground. It doubles as a bomb shelter. And it's filled with propaganda pictures and even patriotic music. All right, we're moving now. It's pretty smooth. In spite of all the propaganda, analysts say, the population may be getting other glimpses of the world. And young generation somehow very skillfully adapting using the intranet, internet, gaining the momentum and then finding the information. And they finally asking, North Korea is not paradise on Earth. It's actually hell on Earth. But why are we living like this? Up next, a wild card in U.S. relations with North Korea, the former NBA star, Dennis Rodman. The North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, has met with one U.S. citizen, the retired NBA star, Dennis Rod Rodman. They watched uh, basketball together. They ate sushi in February. His country like him? Not like him. Love him. Love him. And guess what? Yes, 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 I love him. I love the guy's awesome. Rodman was there for an HBO series called Vice. Fareed Zakaria is a consulting producer for that, uh, uh, for Vice, which is part of our sister network, HBO. Uh, the, you know, it's hard to, when I heard that Dennis Rodman was going, I couldn't believe it. I don't know about you, but you can't make this kind of stuff up. You can make it up. He wanted Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan perhaps wisely decided he not to be part Michael of it. Uh, you know what partly this tells you to add to the complexity of the story is this 29 year old boy Kim Jong-un is probably not running national security strategy. The, the guy's a few months in the job. There's a military dictatorship. Uh, he's fully in control of basketball policy for North Korea, but national security policy is probably being controlled by some very senior generals. He is the son, though, of Kim Jong-il, uh, uh, the grandson of the founder of North Korea, so the power he has potentially is enormous. Enormous, and it unifies the country, and it keeps the, the regime intact, but probably behind the scenes there are, there are people actually pulling the strings, which makes it more complicated because there are probably multiple centers of power here. Where do you see this going, bottom line? Bottom line, I think they will be deterred. I think they're trying to get attention. They're trying to get concessions. The Obama administration is probably not going to do it, so we'll probably ride this out. But as you said at the start, there can be miscalculations. Yeah, there always can be.